school programs at the time, um, we really sat down and said, okay, how can we really change this? How can we reverse the idea of children coming in and simply sitting and listening? Let's really make this a an experience where kids come out of it not saying how much they enjoyed or didn't enjoy the concert, but they are asking other people, how do you think I did? How was I? Right? Because it's a very different, it's a very different stance um, when you feel like you're an active participant, a performer. Hi, you're listening to Conversations with Musicians with Leah Roseman. This podcast strives to inspire you through the personal stories of a diversity of musicians worldwide with in-depth conversations and great music that reveal the depth and breadth to a life in music. Thomas Cavanis is a wonderful American composer of works for opera, theater, dance, film, and the concert stage. He's been a member of the faculty of the Juilliard School since 1998 and leads the Lullaby Project at Carnegie Hall, serving young parents in shelters, hospitals, and prisons with collaboratively created songs for their children. We talked about all this and much more, including his work creating Carnegie Hall's Link Up. I was curious about these many facets to Thomas's life as both a composer and educator, and you'll find this episode has gorgeous, inspiring music of his, as well as great stories from his diverse career as a teaching artist, working with music educators, students of all ages, and meaningful outreach in the community. You'll hear performances from pianists Michael Shin and Jessica Chow Shin, singer Joyce D. Donato, and towards the beginning of the episode, you'll hear some of Thomas's great music for string quartet, performed by the Charleston Symphony String Quartet. Like all my episodes, you can watch this on my YouTube channel or listen to the podcast on all the platforms, and I've also linked the transcript to my website, leahroseman.com. Finally, before we get into the episode, did you know that this podcast is in season four and that I send out a weekly email newsletter where you can get access to sneak peeks of upcoming guests and be inspired by highlights from the archive? Have a look at the description of this episode where you'll find all the links, including the support link to buy this independent podcaster a coffee. Now to the episode. Hi, Thomas. Thanks so much for joining me here today. Yeah, my pleasure. I see you're, you're at your piano, and um, you will be talking about some of your beautiful piano music and different inspiring uh, projects you've been involved with. But let's start with the string quartet recordings. Parma Records is releasing all of your string quartets, and I listened to the first record, which has just been released. So I'm curious, did, have you played string instruments as all, at all? Because you play write really well for strings. <laughs> In the fourth grade, I started as a cellist, but I quickly transferred on to the piano once I sort of got the, the, the sense that I was interested in writing music um, and didn't continue with the cello. But I still love, you know, string instruments, you know, and, and, and love them then and, and love them now. So. Mm-hmm. So the first um, string quartet on this record was from 1990, and then there was a bit of hiatus. Was there a commission, or was there a reason why you'd written that early string quartet? No. The, the, um, the first string quartet I really wrote on spec. I wrote it because I really wanted to write one. And the, the, the reason that I got started on it was um, I, I had been doing some work in opera, and I worked with a director named Graham Vick, who was doing um, Madame Butterfly at the English National Opera. That was kind of at the end of the 80s. And we had become friends. And he gave me um, a copy of the Janacek string quartets, which I did not know. I loved the Bartok string quartets. I loved the he- you know, Haydn. I, lo- I loved the stuff that I p- had studied so far in school. Um, but I didn't know the Janacek quartets. And when I listened to them, I was riding, I remember riding on a train up the Hudson River, and I just kind of broke into tears and said to myself, I have to write a string quartet. I didn't realize I needed to write a string quartet, but at that moment, it became clear. And um, so I had no performance on the horizon. I had friends of mine uh, were in the Alexander String Quartet, uh, but they were getting ready to move out to the West Coast, and so I wasn't sure whether they would play it or not. Um, But I still said, like, no, I'm just going to write it anyway. And uh, luckily, you know, about, um, I mean, after I finished it, I submitted it to the Charles Ives Center for American Music, um, and I won an award where I, I was invited to go there and have the um, the piece performed as part of a festival that Charlie Castleman was running. And, um, yeah, so I got to hear it right away. So I, I feel very lucky in that in that way. 
Yeah. Yeah, I really feel for composers. You know, a lot of the times people write things and don't get it heard or not in a professional setting. Now, in terms of tracks from this record, um, can we talk about the uh, the four elements, the earth? Mm -hmm. Maybe you could speak to your idea behind that. Right. So this is a much more recent yeah. um, quartet, but interestingly, also connected to my friend Graham Vick. Mm -hmm. um, so this is many, many years later. Um, Graham, Graham and I uh, remained friends, and he died um, of COVID. Uh, 19 in uh, London in the summer of uh, 2021. And I was just devastated. Um, and I had on my books, on my, my plan was to write another quartet, my fifth string quartet um, over the summer. But I hadn't begun it yet when I uh, got this news. And um, I, I guess I figured... Um, you know, I tried to think about Graham's um, last year, which he spent mostly on the Isle of Crete. Mm. Um, that's where they were isolating. And um, he had not gotten a vaccine yet. They hadn't come out yet um, in, at that point um, in, in early, you know, late 20, early 21. So they were still there in their place on, on, on Crete. And uh, he tragically sort of came back to London to get his vaccine, but before he got it, he contracted the disease and died. But thinking about his last year on Crete, I began to think about the Mediterranean, about the kind of, again, about our Earth, our planet. Um, I was thinking about, you know, climate change and the climate crisis because so much of uh, many of the conversations that we were having um, in arts education was about how could teaching artists and arts educators address climate change? What could we do? Um, and I guess all of those things sort of came together to make me think about, well, you know, I could structure this quartet in kind of the classical Greek elements, um, earth, air, fire, water. And um, I sketched out, a, you know, a, a kind of a scenario for the quartet and then began working on it. Mm -hmm. Well, it's really powerful. Uh, is there something you'd like to include? I was thinking... The, the quartet, they put out a video of um, the end of water, which might be nice. Yeah. A few people listen, um, watch on YouTube. And Great. for those listeners, it's nice if they can see. Something. That would be lovely. Okay. Yeah, I, yeah. You're about to hear an excerpt from String Quartet Number no. 5, Four Elements, the last section from the final movement, Water, performed by the Charleston Symphony String Quartet. Please check the description of this episode to find all the links. And the, the first violinist in that quartet, Yuri Becker, so he's mm -hmm. also artistic director of Charleston Symphony, where you're originally from. Do you have a long-standing association with him? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, Yuri is somebody that um, I met in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, the orchestra went through some very difficult times. Um, they actually went out of business for a year mm -hmm. um, in a 
I don't know, maybe this is 15 years ago or so. Um, they were having very difficult times. Yuri had been uh, the concert master during that transition, and he was really the person who sort of kept the fire going <laughs> for the Charleston Symphony. And um, I, I met him, um, I guess, just after they started back up again. Um, I had offered, I had said to them, look, as you're getting started again, I do these concerts at Carnegie Hall where I'm the composer in residence and the host for Link Up. And these concerts are done all over the place. And if you if you want to do these concerts in Charleston, we'll give you all the materials for free. And, you know, this will at least get you up and running with, um, you know, being able to do concerts for schools, et cetera. And um, so they, they took me up on it. And they came to New York. They saw the concerts that we did at Carnegie Hall. Um, they kind of, you know, signed on to doing the package down in Charleston. And so I said, if you do it, I'll go down and I will contribute my hosting for free. Mm -hmm you know, at least as we get started, you know, um, now they're paying me. Um, <laughs> uh, they've, they've got a little better footing, um, going on now, but, but Yuri was, um, the concert master and kind of, again, a sort of a driving force with the orchestra at that time. Um, Ken Lamb was the music director. Um, and then after Ken left, he's now running the Juilliard Tianjin orchestral program in China. Um, but, after he left, um, yeah, Yuri took over as um, artistic director and um, has been trying a very different model there without a, kind of an ongoing music director at the moment, but really bringing in kind of higher powered sort of guest conductors. You know, they've had Pinky Zuckerman and Gerard Schwartz and William Eddins and all kinds of people uh, coming in to, to guest conduct. So, um, yeah, I really enjoyed getting to know um, Yuri, and it started just doing those school concerts. Mm -hmm. This next musical selection is the movement Fire, the third movement from Four Elements, Thomas Cavanis's String Quartet No. 5, performed by the Charleston Symphony String Quartet.
Well, you mentioned the Link Up program. Would you like to speak to that project and what it's meant to you? Yeah, so, you know, um, I've worked with orchestras um, really throughout my career. I started with the New York Chamber Symphony and Gerard Schwartz back at the 92nd Street Y in the early 90s. I went on to work with the New York Philharmonic, both as a teaching artist and then as um, education director. And all the time that I was doing that, I kept having a vision of what I thought a um, a young person's concert, a school's concert, could really be. And at the New York Philharmonic, honestly, I was able to experiment with a couple of little elements, but the, the environment was not right for the kind of full-scale, wholesale change that I was looking for. And so um, I left. Uh, in 2004, I left, and um, I did a, about a four-year stint with the Philadelphia Orchestra, um, in a position that was uh, ostensibly just about experimentation. Okay. And that's really, we, ch it, we tried a lot of different things in the school concerts and in the family concerts, and all really, really helpful and useful information. But I still wasn't quite there yet. And then in um, 2010, um, Carnegie uh, hired me as the composer in residence and the host and said, you know, and and basically, along with uh, at the time, it was um, a horn player named um, uh, Misty Toll, uh, who was r running the um, kind of school programs at the time. Um, we really sat down and said, "Okay, how can we really change this? How can we reverse the idea of children coming in and simply sitting and listening? How can we turn this into a fully interactive, you know, where the kids are involved in every." basically every single piece in a very intentional and purposeful way. Um, I'd been doing a bunch of work with recorders in the schools, not by choice really to begin with. It was Kurt Mazur at the Philharmonic who, who kind of insisted on using recorders. And I, I, you know, initially I thought, oh, this is going to be a nightmare, you know, some old German idea that we're trying to kind of, you know, transplant onto um, an, an urban, um, you know, bunch of, students, but it didn't turn out that way. Actually, students really love being able to play a simple melodic instrument at that age level. We, we were able to do really cool and inventive things with it. So part of the thing of Link Up was like, let's take that idea and let's um, put it on steroids. Let's make sure that every song has a part. Um, let's create, let's backwards map it instead of saying, you know, how can we fit this into what the orchestra plays? Let's design things that the orchestra plays that have children at their center. Um, and so if we need to transpose things and change keys and shorten things and, you know, uh, make different kinds of arrangements for pieces, let's do it. Let's write new things um, for it. Let's, um, let's really make this a... Um, an experience where kids come out of it not saying how much they enjoyed or didn't enjoy the concert, but they are asking other people, how do you think I did? How was I? Mm. Right? Because it's, it's a very different stance um, when you feel like you're an active participant, a performer. So how does this work? Is there singing and, and instruments Yes, exactly. So with each song, um, you know, for instance, the song that I wrote initially, which was the invitational song, which now is the sort of the theme song um, of Link Up Around the World, um, is called Come to Play. Yeah. And it has three vocal parts. Um, each of those parts can also be played easily on the recorder. Um, and there are, there are domain, it's a, it's a domain project. So in other words, there's a simple part that can be done with, if you just know three notes, 
if you just know G, A, and B on the okay. recorder. Um, there's a part that you can do that's a little bit harder that has an octave stretch. Um, and then there's another part that's very, quite syncopated and has a high E. So um, it, it takes you know a greater skill. And generally speaking, we split those along the third, fourth, and fifth grade level. But it's all done in collaboration with music teachers. Mm -hmm. So I never write anything or arrange anything or design anything without... Uh, kind of focus group testing it beforehand in classrooms okay. with music teachers giving um, critique and, and feedback. Okay. I spoke with um, an Australian musician, Philip Griffin, and he had been involved in New Zealand for a number of years with their ukulele program in schools. He said it's just huge there. They have these huge yeah. ukulele orchestras. What do you think about the ukulele in schools? Yeah, great. I think it's great. I and and I've 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 learned about that program and um and in fact we did link up in New Zealand um with the Auckland uh, Philharmo uh Philharmonic Orchestra and um yeah, I think there's some um, there's some amazing things going on down in Australia at, with the Lullaby Project too. Um mm -hmm. but I think yes, ukuleles in school, any of these simple melodic instruments um, I mean, we, we also invite kids to bring their violins to Carnegie Hall and play their parts from Link Up. So when we're doing that, so it's and we've even done it with full like band compliments. Yeah. So people have been playing their parts, playing the tuba. So, you know, there's there are all kinds of possibilities, but I love the ukulele. Yeah. So how did this spread around the world? This program? Well, basically Carnegie started, it had a few partners that it began with over the years. Um, but once we inverted the kind of the formula of it mm -hmm. in 2010, Carnegie offered it um, basically for free to orchestras around the country and said, you know, you're going to have to pay for the buses and you're going to have to pay for the orchestra. And, you know, I mean, th you know, that still is a cost that you're going to, but we will provide the script, the music, all the arrangements, the curriculum materials and the professional development. And we'll invite you. This was the really cool thing that Carnegie did was that they said, we'll invite you to come for, for two nights to New York. You'll, you'll come and you'll learn, um, you know, some of the material yourself, you'll attend a link up concert and you'll have a kind of a conference mm -hmm. around the link up concert with other orchestra administrators and educators. And um, so people were enticed by that. You know, that, that was the kind of the, the draw, if you will, the kind of the bait. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, then they just, you know, they fell in love with it. And um, it was, then it sort of spread word of mouth. People just said, oh, you know, you need to check out this link up thing. It's amazing. Okay. And we also gave people a lot of flexibility. We said, if you don't want to do a particular piece or you you know, maybe you want to feature the concerto winner, you know, or something that you already have that's ongoing and it doesn't, you know, then go ahead. Just, you need, just work it out. In other words, you can customize it. We don't insist on a package. Um, we have elements that we think work really, really well and they've been tested and, you know, in, in classrooms and in the concert hall. But if you want to customize it yourself, go right ahead yeah well you mentioned the lullaby project which of course I want to ask you about so that you must be very close to your heart yes it <laughs> is yeah yeah um, this this is work that kind of again came out of out of my work as um, a teaching artist and my desire to see musical creativity kind of at the at the center of music teaching um, not just in schools but also for people in um, senior centers and in uh, prisons and in hospitals I feel like musical creativity is um, it's the way that we actually learn the most about the people we want to engage with and so that was, you know, really part of all of my work. I was doing a, um, I was doing a songwriting project with kids who had HIV um, at a hospital in the Bronx. And so public hospital uh, was working alongside a um, psychologist who was running an, an after kind of an after school group for kids who were having difficulty uh, adhering to their medications. And so they were in this special, you know, kind of weekly meeting with the psychologist to kind of talk through their issues. And we, we basically attached a songwriting workshop to it so that um, after they had their regular meeting, they'd have like, you know, an hour and a half to kind of hang out, have a snack, 
and work on a song. Um, we had a band <laughs> that was um, ready to help and then perform their pieces kind of at the end of the process. And we did it over, I think it was a 12-week songwriting workshop. And it was great. We had a really we had a good time and we did a couple of concerts. One was in the evening for the kind of parents and families and, and, and friends of these um, young songwriters. Um, and then one of them was for the hospital staff. So we did it at lunchtime. So it was a brown bag concert and people came. And when we did it, there was somebody, there was um, a, a nurse and a social worker who'd come together from the OBGYN department of the hospital. And they were very moved by the concert. And afterwards they said, is there any way you could do something like this for our pregnant teens? There's so much stigma surrounding pregnancy at their age, but you know they and so much complexity with their families and so on. But these are all you know, um, pregnant teens who are deciding to keep their children, and we need to you know give them support and so on. And so I said, sure, but but maybe it should be a lullaby. It could be a you know our twelve week songwriting thing that we did. I said, but but maybe actually it's simpler than that. Maybe it's really just a song for the baby. And so we we talked about ways in which that might help with uh, mother infant attachment. Um, and we did a little pilot project then in two thousand eleven, and um, and started the project. And it was again as as soon as we did it, like the first one. Um, we knew, and our our colleagues at Carnegie Hall knew that we were kind of on to something, and they immediately hired researchers to come in and take a look at what we were doing, but also so that we could really, you know, so that we could begin to create the language for spread, and that was from the beginning something that we thought about: how could we how could we get other people interested. Um, in this idea, and also uh, recognizing we weren't the only ones who were doing it. There were a lot of people working with lullabies around the world. Um, we also realized there was a lot of research that we needed to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you think, Thomas, that, uh, you know, music accesses the most emotions so directly, and also the process, that kind of creativity people can access flow, and that helps with anxiety and stress? I do, and I think, you know, with what we found with the Lullaby Project is that since the object of your songwriting is so close and personal and deeply personal, that one of the things that it does in terms of the relationship between the professional musician and the young mother or young family that's, that's working on it is that you go to a deep place really fast, um, faster than in other kinds of circumstances. You know, <laughs> teaching artists are always in the business of trying to think of icebreakers and way to get people to be more comfortable with each other. It's just funny. In Lullaby, it just, it almost doesn't exist. It's kind of like you've come there to do a very specific thing, to work on a song that's for your child. It's like, shoo, it just goes right there. Mm -hmm. Are there stories you can recall that were uh, sort of unexpected as part of that project? Many, many, um, and and I guess one of them that sticks out is we started a group um, at this same hospital where we began the project in the Bronx, and uh, we had you know I think in the, it was a small group it was five maybe five women who um, were working together on you know separate songs, but the, even in that short period of time, which was really I don't know I think it must have been about, maybe we spent. 12 hours together, 15 hours together, something like that. But in that time, the group formed so in such a strong way that um, th these young women, some of them who were in foster programs and who were about to age out mm -hmm. <laughs> of, of, of that, um, they all ended up moving in together oh. and raising their children together. Um, at least for the first couple of years. And, you know, we've kept in touch with some of those uh, moms. And, um, yeah, who would have thought, you know, in such a short period of time that people would feel comfortable enough to say, hey, let's get a place. Hmm. That's, that's really touching. That's, 
In terms of sharing some of that music, I know that you've had some famous singers record some of these songs. I mean, is there something we could share as part of this episode? Some of those albums? Sure. You know, I mean, I have to say that our biggest champion right away, right right out of the gate, um, I think two years into the project was uh, Joyce DiDonato, the soprano, mm -hmm. mezzo-soprano. And she, she immediately said, um, what can I do? And we said, well come sing, come learn a couple of these songs and sing them in a concert. And so she did, um, I think in 2000, even 14, something like that. Um, and so on the album, Hopes and Dreams, there are a couple of the, the uh, cuts that, any of the cuts with Joyce um, would be great. But there are also, there's a Fiona Apple one that I particularly love. Can't I wait heard to, that, so there, yeah. Yeah, the Fiona Apple. So that was a good one. But, you know, yeah, the, um, the, yeah any of the ones with Joyce would be great. You're about to hear singer Joyce DiDonato performing one of the lullabies from the Lullaby Project on the album Hopes and Dreams. This composition is entitled Peace by Tamias Fernandez with Deirdre Struck. <laughs> First I thought, what am I gonna do? How can I tell people the truth? Even so, I already knew that I was meant to be with you, my dear. I have so many questions. Soon to be answered Will you play soccer Just like your daddy does Am I squishing you When I sleep at night I'm wishing Tiny bits of outrageous love and your association. <laughs> I love, love, love that album and also the um, solo, the sketches of Benascus. So um, Michael Shin and Jessica Chow Shin, you, you got to know them over a period of time working with them, different projects. 
Yes. So Michael was my office mate at the, you okay. know, in the theory department at Juilliard. We just happened to be, you know, sitting next to each <laughs> other. Um, very nice guy. I really liked him. Um, and um, and kind of early on in our office sharing, um, I don't know how, exactly how this happened, but we were just sitting there one day and he, he sort of shyly, maybe not so shyly, you know, confided that... Um, He'd gone out with a really lovely woman, you know, and that he'd had a really great time and that she was beautiful and, you know, so on. And I said, that's that's terrific. And I said, you know, tell me about her. And he said, you know, and she's studying in the collaborative piano department um, at Juilliard. And I said, well, yeah, that's. That totally makes sense. I said, if, if you know, if you really want this to work out, Michael, you, you got to play with her. You, you have to play the piano with her. And he says, well, but I'm a soloist. I said, you're crazy. Play some piano four hands. That's the way you're good. You're, you know, that's how to, and he goes, he said, well, if you wrote me something, you know, to, to play. And so I did, I wrote, I wrote a piece called mechanicals, um, that the two of them did together. And mostly it was almost a joke between us because it, it called uh, on lots of, um, kind of, uh, athletics um, in the piano forehands business of like, you know, reaching over the yeah. other person and so on. It was very much kind of like getting in and out of people's space. Um, but they played that piece a couple times um, in New York City and had a great time. And yeah, and then they ended up getting, you know, engaged and then married. So we've had a long relationship that way. And, and they jokingly referred to me as, you know, kind of a, a Cupid of theirs. So. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the theme uh, in Tiny Bits of Outrageous Love relates to your wife, Deborah. Yeah. So if right. you, do you want to speak to that? Sure. Well, um, so after we did Mechanicals, um, um, we decided that the next thing that we should do is, um, you know, I should write another piece um, for them. And uh, we weren't quite sure. Was it going to be two pianos? Was it going to be piano, piano four hands? We weren't sure. Um, in the meantime, Michael and Jessica had started a music festival called Piano Sonoma, which is, you know, um, has grown uh, immensely since uh, its its first days. And it's now out at um, Sonoma State at the Green Center uh, for Music out there and um, every summer. And um, it's become a big thing. They they were doing a, a, a gala, you know, a salon kind of performance to raise money. And so um, they invited me, um, and you know, I, I and I went, and um, they played the Brahms waltzes um, for piano four hands, and um, I I just had one of these experiences, you know, those this, those kind of lift you out of your seat experiences when you're you know listening to a piece of music as an audience member, and um, and it was especially the one in A major, I think it's number 15. I, I heard that piece and I was like, oh, that's what I need to write. I need to write, a it's like a little jewel. It's mm -hmm. like such a perfect little piece of music. It's not long, it uses repeats. It's just a kind of a miniature, but it's, you know, it's so amazing. I need to write some things like that. And as I was walking across um, I was walking, uh, I remember from, uh, the Yamaha piano salon, which is on fifth Avenue and 54th street. And I was walking over to the train, um, somehow in my head, I thought that's what I want to write a little jewel, a little, a tiny bit. It just needs to be a tiny bit. And, um, I had also been reading, there's a, um, now I'm going to muff the title, but it's, uh, Dave Eggers book. A heartbreaking book of a staggering genius, or I don't remember exactly something like that. Um, I I just read that book about you know six months beforehand, and I thought, oh, so uh, if I play with that idea a little bit, um, maybe that's the title of the piece, "Tiny Bits of Outrageous Love." Um, and I immediately sort of sketched it out on the train. Then I got on the train, and I basically wrote like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I want it to be like the story of a relationship. And here's what each one will be. And, um, and I think I, I have like little titles to each one of them, which I remember I kept in small case letters because I was still thinking tiny bits, you know. And, um, and I pretty much then just wrote the piece. Yeah. No, I really love it. I've listened to it several times. I was hoping we could, uh, well, actually, Love Song, they they've have a video of that. If you want to check with them, yeah. if we could share that. Sure. It'd be nice to see them play. 
And yeah. also uh, the last one too, number seven. Sure. I really sure. love that one. Happy to. You're about to hear Love Song, miniature number three from Tiny Bits of Outrageous Love for Piano Four Hands, performed by Michael Shin and Jessica Chow Shin. <laughs> And so your your wife is a psychiatrist, but also sings, right? Yes, she's a, well. She's she's a psychiatrist and a psychoanalyst. Mm -hmm. She's a violinist mm -hmm. and a singer, um, and uh, yeah, she's amazing. So, <laughs> and the the theme you had mm -hmm. written for her was like an in. Yes. Yeah, so we had this thing. We met when we were in college. We met like on even before college started. But when the dining room wasn't open, we ended up, you know, we, we always joke. We, we It's true. We met in a, in a Dunkin Donuts in New Haven. That's where we met. But, it, you know, because the dining halls weren't open. But um, so we've known each other a long time. And when we were in college, I don't know how this happened, but but somehow we um we invented this little musical theme that we would whistle to each other if we were in a crowd, especially, and we were trying to find each other. David Lewin, who was my music uh, composition teacher at the time, teased me about it because I also included it in um, a string quartet piece that I was working on at the time. And um, he said, oh, you know, oh, that's your Jesus Christ superstar, you know, um, theme. Because it did, it was triadic and it had okay. sort of a, a feel like that. Um, but yeah, we would just whistle this tune to each other to kind of find each other. And actually now my, you know, the shocking thing about my, I have two children and, and they only discovered when this piece came out. Um, that this theme preceded them. They thought it was just the family tune, you Aww. know, to, you know, uh, like, wait a minute, bef you know, before we were born, you know, yes, like, yes, there was a story before you were born. This next composition is the last movement from Tiny Bits of Outrageous Love, entitled Two, performed by Michael Shin and Jessica Chow Shin.
Yeah. It, it, my husband's a musician as well. And there's like a few little family tunes or little songs we'd written for the kids, but you must have beyond lullabies, you must have written some music for your children. Oh, sure. And, you know, when, as they were learning, um, you know, we would we would write little forehands pieces together sometimes with the kids. And um, yeah, and my son, William, is a wonderful uh, songwriter and, you know, music creator out on the West Coast now. So, OK. So, you know, your music, I really love it, but I, I'm always a little scared with new music, I have to admit, because a lot of it is hard to listen to or very dense harmonically. I have to play a lot of this music in orchestra and it's, it might take 10 times through to start to make sense of it, but your music is not like that. Do you think that's related to your different, like your music theater background or is it a conscious choice? I mean, yeah, sure. Right. Because you hear all kinds of things. You hear all the, yeah. the, you know, the world opens up to you as a musician. You hear all the things that the ways that music could be. Um, but yeah, I guess, you know, I I loved um I grew up on yeah musical theater and kind of pop music and um and all, kind of all the music that I was listening to as a as a teenager it's it's kind of stuck with me um that music and um that all had was very sort of you know based on the idea of a melody that mm -hmm. was um kind of memorable and could be you know shared um, in a way, and that also all of the music was quite groove based, you know, and so um, that that sense of like wanting to have something that that has a kind of a consistency, not always, but you know, but that but that has a, a kind of a feel or a vibe to it that that, you know, where a steady pulse is, um, is an important expressive element. That's always been important to me, too. Um, and, uh, you know, I, it, at different moments in my life, I've sort of broken things up more or less mm -hmm. depending, um, on, on what I was working on. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. I love tunes. Yeah. Now you went to Yale, right? Mm -hmm. A previous guest of my, um, series, Adam Blau, he's younger than you, so you wouldn't know him, but I found it interesting. He was saying the official courses at Yale were very, um, we're, we're not so much what he was interested in, but all the acapella groups, all the other stuff that was happening was what yeah. really made that experience amazing musically. Did you have a similar feeling about it? Yeah, I um, I did theater. Yeah, I did theater. You know, I, I actually the truth is, I mean, embarrassingly, like I auditioned for the Spizwinks, um, which was an acapella group at Yale, and uh, I didn't get in. I mean, I, you know, whatever. I just I didn't I didn't, I didn't make the cut. Um, but um, and and. And also, I was I brought into school with me a lot a real interest in the theater. I'd been doing a lot of theater when I was in high school, um, and so um, I continued to do theater at at Yale, but as a composer. And I, you know, anybody who was doing anything, I would just I kind of show up on their doorstep and say, "Hey, can I write music for your production of you know whatever it was?" And I ended up doing uh, music for the Caucasian Chalk Circle. Um, and Cherry Orchard and, you know, uh, Measure for Measure and I, you know, music directed Three Penny Opera. And I felt like that was where the real learning was. I mean, look, I took courses. I took a music history course and I took music theory and had really great people. Um, and, and that was all really interesting. But, um, but the theater was the place where, like, first of all, you had to create the music. It had to be done. Um, it immediately got an audience. It immediately got reaction. Mm -hmm. um, and you were working with, I mean, all the people that I worked with when I was I at college, like they're now, you know, professionals working in New York and, and, and around the country. So I feel like, you know, I, it, we, we were all sort of growing up together and teaching each other. Mm -hmm. If we could backtrack a little bit to your childhood, I, I heard you tell the story about your early piano lessons, which was kind of sad. And then you know, you, you got sort of a late, later yeah. start, actually, in a way. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I did. And um, so I actually spent a lot of my kind of, a, you know, upper elementary uh, time uh, just doing sports. And, um, and music came a little bit later. I got uh, the theater was the thing that really got me was I did a production of The King and I. I started to take some, some um, piano lessons and, and pretty much right from the moment uh, you know, I was able to really sit down and have uh, time at the keyboard. I began to play by ear, 
Um, and that allowed me to do a lot of different things, but it, including, you know, songwriting so that, you know, in the, I wrote a little pop opera when I was in the ninth grade, when I was 14 years old, um, and we produced it and, you know, um, we did several performances of it and, you know, I'm still friends with many of the people who were in that cast. So fabulous. So, but when you first started, when you were very young, I, I'd heard you tell a story in another interview that you were six years mm -hmm. old. You, you wanted piano lessons. Oh, that story. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I, so when I, I wanted to, I wanted to play the piano desperately when I was quite young, when yeah. I was in the first grade and uh, I begged my parents. Um, and so they rented a piano, the piano arrived. I, the only person they could figure out for me to take lessons from was the organist at our church. And, um, and yeah, he was, uh, very, um, <laughs> he was not a nice man <laughs> and, um, he, you know, obviously a talented musician, but, um, impatient with young children and impatient with me. And I don't think I was an easy student, um, kind of hyperactive, whatever. And, um, and so, yes, my mother walked into a lesson when he was, um, using a ruler to, you know, hit my hands. I don't know, correcting my hand position or just just generally <laughs> punishing me I'm not sure what it was but my mother was horrified and she was like this this is it no more no more piano teacher no more piano the piano was sent back to the um, Fox Music House in, of Charleston which is that was the rental you know place at the time and still is I think and yeah so so um, I, and I was uh, distraught I was very sad um, that the piano had been you know uh, ejected from, extruded from our house. Um, and I continued to beg for the piano, you know, it took another five years. And then we finally moved away to a different neighborhood. My mother f actually then met a teacher who, um, was a ni much nicer person who happened to live down the street and I could bike there without any, you know, real trouble. And so I was able to finally start up again around, around 11 or 12. Hmm. Yeah. It's interesting to me the story because let's say you had continued with this teacher, you, who knows what problems you would have had, but maybe you would have become a pianist primarily instead of a composer primarily. Mm -hmm. That's quite that's quite possible. Yeah, you know, I I, I don't know. Um, I I think um, I look at the I certainly look at my. Um, my colleagues who started really young and um, have the kinds of I, chops I wish I had now. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and, and and there's a part of me that's kind of jealous that you know I, I didn't I didn't have that sort of um, training. By the time I really started to play, I could play enough by ear that I was making all, I was all the shortcuts. You know, it's like mm -hmm. oh the hand and exercises I don't think so. Oh the you know the scales well a little. You know, but I mean I <laughs> I, I could do so much um, by ear that I, you know, I didn't do the kind of rigorous, um, uh, practice over time that would have allowed me to, to, to be a, certainly to be a, a concert pianist. That's not, you know, um, I, I play enough, I play in my classes, um, at Juilliard and I, and I, but I practice, you know, if I'm playing a segment of a piece mm -hmm. of music to demonstrate something, um, when I'm doing a music theory class at Juilliard, I, I definitely practice before I go in. I don't, I, I don't mess around because I, I need to. Mm -hmm. In your approach to teaching music Sorry. theory, do you try to engage, like the similar to the way we were talking about just bringing kids into an orchestra concert, do you mm -hmm. try to engage your students so that they're creating and not just passively, you know what I mean? Yeah. We actually have, in my theory classes, we do it as a course and lab. Okay. So uh, we meet twice a week. So on Tuesdays is course. So mm -hmm. they have homework to do, they have reading to do, and we practice analytic concepts um, and, and study music together mm -hmm. in that, you know, Tuesday meeting. But on Fridays, there's always a creative assignment. It's, and uh, what I say to them is it's a brief radical experiment in which you're working, it could be anything, you know, uh, pitch class set theory or classic serialism or um, we're, I'm doing a, an elective right now um, that's called Time Benders and we work on innovations in rhythm and time in the 20 and 21st century mm -hmm. and uh, the, the lab for last Friday was called hints of eternity 
How can you use your instrument, a solo piece, to hint at eternity? What are the things that you can do? And we, of course, we're studying Messiaen, and we're, you know, a variety of other things, but we're um, really looking at, at those ideas. But there's always a, yeah, a, a lab on Friday where the students make up their own things. That's really wonderful to hear. And you also teach dance students. I was curious about that. That's where I just came from. I had a, a class yeah. with the dancers this morning. Um, they have a per performance tonight, so they're kind of nervous, and <laughs> that was a good energy to have in the room today. Um, but yes, I've worked um, with the dancers. I always work with the first-year dancers. They're like 18 years old. They've just come out of high school. They're extremely talented dancers, but they don't necessarily have um, musical training. Mm -hmm. Some do and some don't. Some might have been, you know, in choir or musical theater or something like that in in high school but most of them have have really switched over to dance so intensively that even if they did study an instrument early on they've given it up mm -hmm. um, they're really you know dancing s so many hours a day um, now and to also to get into Juilliard they needed to do that kind of intense um, work so our class, Music Studies for Dance, is a chance for them to really think about the connections between music and dance and to learn something um, about the different genres. So we study songs, we study opera. Right now we're studying instrumental music, so we're studying the Bach cello suites. Um, and through that, through the lens of Baroque dances. So okay. today, for instance, they were doing presentations on the different Baroque dances of a, of a Baroque suite. Okay. You have lucky students. That sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> we have a good time. Hi, just a short break from the episode, which I hope you're enjoying so far. If you want to check out over 100 episodes you may have missed, in addition to your podcast player or YouTube, I have an extensive website, leahroseman.com, with show notes, transcripts, the complete catalog of episodes, and you can sign up there for my weekly newsletter to get access to sneak peeks of upcoming guests. Please do share your favorite episodes with your friends, follow me on social media, and share my posts. And if you can spare a few dollars to help support the series, that would be amazing. And you can find that link in the show notes. I'm an independent podcaster, and I really do need the help of my listeners. Now back to the episode. If we could talk about the idea of teaching artists and how you got into this and how this differs from being you know, a music teacher. In the classic sure. Sense. Well, I've done both. I've been a music teacher and um, I've been, a, but teaching artists much longer. Um, I did one year of being a you know traditional kind of you know uh, school music teacher um, out of uh, college, um, but quickly um, realized I number one I wanted to compose more. I wanted more flexibility in my in my schedule, and I was looking around for. Um, different possibilities. And a friend of mine said, oh, you should check out the Lincoln Center Institute. They have some flexible gigs. <laughs> and so I have to admit that my interest in it to begin with was totally selfish. It just was about, can I get some work <laughs> that is interesting and fun to do, but um, flexible in terms of its schedule? Mm -hmm. And and really, that was that was it. I was looking for something that would complement my composing time, um, and you know, the the money was pretty good. The people were very nice. I, I auditioned, and they offered me you know a, a a role in in doing this work, and I was happy to learn about it. I didn't I really know anything about teaching artistry. Had never heard the term before, um, but. Uh, you know, they were interested in the time in, in sort of in promoting notions of um, aesthetic education, right? And um, this is really where the work of art is the focus of everything you do. And Lincoln Center had an interest in this because they were thinking this was a way that they could help students prepare to come to the opera or to the symphony or to the ballet or to the theater, right? They could really, by focusing in on a work of art in mm -hmm. a particular way, um, and so there was a very clear model that had been um, sort of worked out by the folks at Lincoln Center Institute. And we knew that we would have two to three sessions in a classroom uh, prior to the students witnessing or engaging with a work of art, and then we'd have one session afterwards. So we'd go in, we'd do some, do some process-oriented work that was focused on that, whatever the work of art was. They would have their 
performance or their visit to the museum or, you know, whatever it was. It could sometimes be a concert where the, you know, musicians were coming to their school to play in the school auditorium. Um, and then we would do a reflective session with them afterwards on basically how was that? How was that experience? And and how what connections were you able to make between the work we did prior, um, you know, and, and to the work uh, once you engage with it in the performance or on the on the wall what do you mean by process oriented work well so such a good question i mean some of them could be um really creative um, activities so for instance we were studying the schubert um quartet sots, right mm-hmm. this nine minute long yeah. kind of a um you know all in one miniature string quartet um and um beautiful beautiful piece and with the teachers, we decided um, that two things were really important. One was that the students needed to get some hands-on feeling of what it was like to play a string instrument, even though they were in the second grade and, and were not playing violins mm-hmm. and violas, right, and, and cellos. So what could we do? So we decided we would build instruments. We would build kind of shoebox instruments, um, but that had suspended rubber bands for different pitches, and we would experiment with that, trying to make the best possible shoebox, you know, um, instrument we could. And then once we did that, we would do some improvisatory activities that, that really got at the, the, the Schubert, which, you know, my interest in it was in part in, was the kids hearing um, the way that um, instruments could play in, uh, for instance, parallel harmony. Mm -hmm. I really wanted them to be just experience kind of like the joy of that and the knowledge um, of that rather than the piece just kind of washing over them. I wanted them to kind of get inside of it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So we did that. We we did a little unit where that's what the students did. They they used their rubber band um, instruments, but they also we did we did it so that we created different kinds of conversations. So sometimes there were fights, sometimes there were interruptions, sometimes there were kind of like moments of harmonious friendship, you know, and and you know, to our delight, I think the teacher's delight and, and, and mine too, was the students were able to, in the Schubert, they were going, oh, that's the part where they're in love. That's, you know, where the two violins are in love, and they were playing in sixths or thirds or, yeah. you know, what, whatever it was. Um, and uh, so that's the kind of an example of it. But, you know, every work of art is different. And so then, in a way, like every unit of study, which is what we would call them, um, every unit of study was different too. Mm-hmm. And you've worked quite a bit with music teachers as well, right? Yeah, a lot. Yeah, at uh, Carnegie Hall, we've been doing um, uh, the Music Educators Workshop there for several years. Joanna Massey, who uh, runs the programs there, started it. Um, and I've been a faculty member with lots of different musicians. Um, and we, we've we had both a kind of a, a you know, during the year program where um, once a month on a Saturday, music teachers come together to share best practices, Mm -hmm. take different um, classes or, um, you know, workshops. And so I've done, you know, workshops in musical creativity um, as part of the music educators workshop. And that allows me to work with really just inspiring inspiring educators from from it, you know new york but then in the summer we do uh one where anybody can come from anywhere and um we have a, a much wider audience from across the country so do you find a lot of them are struggling with burnout and maybe aren't playing or singing uh away from school because it's so intense, their days. Yes, and so one of the things that we did immediately in response to that was that we formed our own ensembles. So as part of this, people sing in a choir, they play in a band, there's a jazz improv ensemble, I think there's a percussion group, you know. So we're trying to make space for that um, where it, it has been harder for them to do that. But, you know, I mean, at the same time, like I think of somebody like Kevin LeBlanc who uh, is a trumpet player and teaches at LaGuardia in in, um, New York City, which is kind of the arts high school, Mm -hmm. the fame high school. (laughs) And um, he has his own big band. And, you know, I mean, he's he's a a musician at such a high level. Um, But he's also one of our our, you know, workshop participants because he loves it because he's he's learning from from folks there, too. Mm -hmm. And are you using improvisation with them? 
Yeah, we do. We do. And I um, especially have been doing workshops on vocal improv, um, not so much instrumental improv for mm-hmm. me, but uh, I, I do a lot of circle singing and facilitation of uh, that kind of, of, of vocal improv. Uh, Bobby McFerrin, Rhiannon, um, you know, uh, a, a variety of people who um, have have done that work. So Wonderful. And you've written uh, operas for toddlers. Yes. <laughs> operas for babies. Who knew? I had no, I mean, this one really kind of came out of left field, but it came out of the Lullaby Project. Okay. I was doing the Lullaby Project, and as I said, one of the things I knew immediately was that we had a lot to learn from other people who were already working with Lullaby around the world in different, you know, in different Australia, they, there's a lot of lullaby work that goes on there. Um, in, um, uh, the Nordic countries in Norway and Sweden and Denmark, the really interesting things. And in London, a friend of mine said, Oh, you have to check out this, um, radio interview show on BBC three. I think it was, and this is back in, I think, 2000, 14, 15, something like that. And we'd just been doing the Lullaby Project for a few years. And um, they described a project in London Hospital, which was a multicultural exchange project with lullabies. So these were, you know, a lot of immigrant um, mothers uh, who had come to the UK, um, who um, were on a um, kind of a a ward together in in London Hospital. And they were... um, teaching each other uh, all of these lullabies from different langu- in different languages. And it just sounded fascinating to me. And so um, I called up the group that was responsible for doing it in London, it was Spitalfields Music. They very nicely, you know, uh, said, yes, you should, you know, you should really see if you can make a meeting with our lead teaching artist, whose name is Zoe Palmer, and um, she can tell you about exactly how this work went you know, how it went down. Mm -hmm. And so um, I made a a kind of cold emailed her and made a kind of a Skype interview with her. And we immediately just hit it off. We just, you know, it's like, oh, we're, we're doing the same work. We're, you know, how did this work if you tried that, you know, and and so on. And um, we had a great time talking to each other. And at the end of that call, she said, oh, yes. And I also um, make rumpus operas. And I said, what? is a rumpus opera. And she said, oh, well, they're for babies, operas for babies. I said, that just sounds ridiculous, you know? Are you kidding me? And she said, no, 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 I'll send you some video. And I, I and she, she will testify to this, I was very skeptical. I was like, this sounds like horrible children's theater to me, and there's nothing worse than horrible children's theater, in my opinion. Like, you know, it's of, of all the art forms, you know, um, horrible children's theater is just uh, unbearable, uh, you know, to me. And so I was like, okay, all right, but I'll look. And so she sent me the video and I actually thought they were fantastic. Uh, You know, it was very free form. There was a lot of improvisation, a lot of spontaneity, but the musicians were quite good. Um, There were vocalists and there were instrumentalists and they were just all like on top of it. Like just, they just knew how to make the moment joyful. And, um, and the parents were really into it. And I just was like, oh, we need to make one of these. We need to make one of these at Carnegie Hall. I have a, I have a vocal improv ensemble called Moving Star and we, we could do, we could, you know, we could do it. Um, and so I basically, you know, I pitched it to the Carnegie Hall folks and they gave us a commission and we made our first one in 2017 called O Toy O Toy. Yeah, I heard a b- bit of that. It was really cool. So... I, you know, I, I was just thinking, I've spoken with a lot of composers who've written for kids' TV and cartoons, and most mm-hmm. kids' shows are just, it's its basically like musical theater. There's so much singing. Yeah, that's right. But, so it doesn't seem that strange to me, but I'm just curious in terms of sets or how complicated these opera, these productions are. Yeah, they're quite, they can be, they can be extremely simple. They don't, they can be very low tech DIY, you know, yeah. um, you know, production. Um I have to say, one of the things that happened over the pandemic was that we got a little bit nervous about, um, you know, going, obviously going back live, you know, with um, parents and 
babies mm-hmm. and, you know, all of the things that come with, um, you know, just kind of being around each other, germs. And, you know, it's already a concern for very young children anyway, um, you know, just because of your ability to kind of hold off bacteria, et cetera. And um, so we were concerned about that. And the, the project that we had been working on, we'd sort of had this idea of there being like, thousands of like little objects, oh. uh, like, a, uh, like a mandala of objects was the idea of, you know, the show. And so we thought, well, you know, maybe this is not the right moment for that show. Maybe we need to do something different. And I had been working with um, a projection designer for Link Up who was fabulous. All the stuff on the back wall of Carnegie Hall where the music was scrolling live so the kids could play their Mm. recorders and their violins and sing and so on. And also just like really gorgeous, imaginative projections. And so I asked this designer, Dan Scully, if he would help us think about how we could maybe create some of the same ideas um, with, with, uh, projections, and he immediately said, "Oh yes, we'll we'll put a projection on the you know, projector on the ceiling. Everything will be on the floor. Ah. The babies will be able to crawl around in it, and in fact, they'll be in the set in a certain way." And um, he created a gorgeous show with lights and projections and this kind of center wheel, which created a kind of mandala, you know, a kind of a wonder wheel at the beginning. And it's and it it moved. It was spinning, but it was light. It was projection. It wasn't Mm -hmm. uh, they weren't objects. Um, And so, you know, I don't know. It can be they can be fancy, too. Yeah, I guess is the answer. They can be fancy, too. Yeah, I was just thinking I've been to a couple of art things where they, yeah, they did those kind of projections and it's very immersive. It's wonderful yeah. how far we've come with the technology. Agreed. Yeah. So what are your views on bringing in new audiences to, you know, orchestra concerts and choir concerts and that whole world? Yeah, you know, I mean, I'm interestingly right, right now I'm working on a project which is, um, it's kind of an open house jam mm-hmm. and uh, for orchestras. And it's literally, it, that's what it's for. And the idea is modular. So um, the idea of it is, Leah, you're a string player. I, I'm a violinist, yeah. Yeah. And so you would be in a room with your violin right? And um, you would have a bit of audience that was devoted to you. They would come to you, Mm -hmm. right? There would be, I don't know, it could be anywhere from 10 people to say 30. I don't know. But they would come and you would spend some time with them playing for them. And you would play whatever you wanted to play, your your favorite things that you think show off the instrument. Um, And you, but you would end with a little miniature that I've written called a single clap for violin. And um, then when you're finished with that, you would guide your, you would take your group with you to the next room, which is where the string quintet is. So there have been four other rooms, Mm -hmm. you know, with similar things going on with each of the players playing solos. And then you'd come in and you'd play all of their solos, but now arranged for all five instruments. And then there's an intermission. And afterwards, when you come in, there's a big orchestra piece that has you know, everybody. Um, and, uh, and, and you, but Yate uses the same solos and the same music. But the, I guess the, the idea of it is, right, is um, how can we invite people in, really get them to understand who people are individually in an orchestra, who they are as musicians, what they, um, what they do technically, but also what drives them, what moves them to make the music that they make, um, and to see also how that gradually, you know, grows into um, all the possibilities that are there once an orchestra is assembled, mm-hmm. once, you know, the full orchestra is assembled. So um, I'm interested in all kinds of ideas that will do that, that will get people in and hooked. Because I think it's one thing to, to bring people in, Um, you know, to get them for a kind of crossover idea or, um, you know, or to get them in with their children, right? You know, because that often that is a way that new audiences are coming in is that they're bringing their children to think like, oh, they, they need to have this experience, right? Like they also need to go to a museum. They also need to, you know, travel to, you know, um, I don't know, national parks or whatever. I mean, we went to Algonquin Park when, when, you know, we, we felt like they needed to go to Canada to, 
to, you know, Algonquin Park. We just felt they needed to, right? Um, and so that's true. But I also feel like we, what, what we're not so great at doing is, is right now what we have, we're challenged is how do we hook people? How do we really like kind of get our, <laughs> you know, our talents in there? And I feel like that's an interesting problem to me. Like how, how can orchestras do that, you know? Uh, what are the kinds of projects and performances that will do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, certainly there's different um, ideas to bring in different, you know, recent immigrant groups and yep. just trying to find different demographics. But I have seen a change since the pandemic. I think some of the older people maybe haven't come back. Have you, have you seen a similar switch in New York? Yeah, concerts? well, absolutely. Because right, what, what's happened, right? I mean, the pandemic sort of taught us that there's a lot that you can do at your screen at home. And so there's a lot of that of like kind of defaulting, like, well, you know, yeah. I, I can get something kind of like that, you know, on my screen. And if I just, you know, uh, and, and I already did invest a little more money in, you know, in improving my sound and my, you know, my screen um, because th that was all there was at the time. So yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a big issue. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's a big issue. Yeah. And how do you feel about the way that people should talk or not talk to the audience in classical concerts? Yeah, you know, <laughs> there was one time, uh, you know, a time during my uh, work as a arts education, mm -hmm. um, you know, but both as an administrator and as a teaching artist, where I literally was getting hired to do nothing else but coach musicians mm -hmm. in, you know, speaking to audiences. And in fact, I did it for the Orchestra of St. Luke's and for the New Jersey Symphony Orchestra. And, blah, blah, blah. and um, I was happy to do it. I really was. And the musicians are terrific. They were all, you know, interested in trying to figure it out. Um, but I guess the, for me, the main thing is like, I just don't like the default in one way or another. Mm -hmm. I think it's not a binary, um, you know, question. In other words, sometimes it's great to have a musician turned around or conductor turned around and say something to kind of prepare the moment for this piece because f the circumstances require it. You know, it's actually important. If you don't do it, there are going to be a lot of people sort of boxed out of it in some way, mm -hmm. right? But it's not always right. And sometimes I think people, you know, sometimes I just want to hear the music. And there are sometimes, and as someone who's like, you know, I have spoken to audiences and I've been asked to speak to audiences and asked to coach musicians to speak to audiences. And sometimes I'm in the audience going like, shut up, stop yeah. it. Like, just play the, it's, we're going to get it. Like, this is not hard to figure out. Mm -hmm. You know, this music is there's some music is really complicated or some music needs the context and like, but sometimes it really doesn't. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's actually suffers, you know, um, from that. And so, you know, just play the tune. I mean, I, you know, um, I guess I just think like, that's the thing is that we, what we need is discretion and good judgment and good taste about this thing and not a thing of like, well, we always need to speak, you know, mm -hmm. or we, or we should never speak, you know? I mean, you know, I know the Cleveland has sort of, you know, that people have been writing about with, with uh, Franz Velzer, Merst and Cleveland, because he never speaks. <laughs> he just doesn't speak to the audience pretty much. And like, again, like, why never? Like, uh, I, you know, I, I get that. But, you know, uh, but also, I, but I do enjoy it when Cleveland just plays, I have to say. I, I, it doesn't bother me when, when they just play. Like, it's, it's okay with me. Mm -hmm. It's okay with me. And when the situation does call for someone to speak, what kind of coaching advice have you given to musicians? Well, I mean, uh, I think that really simple things like one relevance, right? Is it relevant? What you're saying, is it relevant? And does it, is it going to open something up rather than shut something down? Right. We don't want, I, I don't never want a musician or, or anybody to tell me what art means. And actually I, I, I'm driven crazy by docents in museums. I just like, don't tell me, like, I just, let me look at the painting, you know? Um, I'm interested in the contextual information and I can read the card that's on the wall and, you know, but if you tell me that this is what it means, then I, uh, that doesn't work for me. For some people, it works beautifully. They, they love a docent. They, that's all they want to do is to go on the docent tour. Um, and God bless, but I, just not for me. Um, but so I guess in talking, when we're talking about music, yeah, relevant, is it relevant? Um, is it personal? Is there a way that a personal kind of connection that you have as a musician 
can also be part of what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And then all the things that are really important, which is like, you know, um, brevity (laughs) and um, the structure of no more than like three ideas or three points. After that, like we, we begin to lose, you know, our, our, whatever, our attention, our, our, our ability to focus um, on that. And, and the, the main thing that I say to musicians is um, that you must insist on rehearsal, that if you are using amplification, it must be adjusted and designed. Mm-hmm. It should not just be like whatever mic is on. I mean, we're mostly asked to speak in halls that are not designed for speaking. You know, they are designed for music. Yeah. And so then they end, we end up speaking into these booming, you know, kinds of uh, circumstances that really where the, the speaking doesn't land, mm-hmm. you know. And look, here we are on screen, right? We're used to hearing the sound at a cer- in a certain way, you know, certain clarity, a certain pop, a certain, you know, forward yeah. kind of, you know, sense of volume. And if we don't get that, from the stage, again, you know, we can feel like we're in a sea. So I always like, you got to rehearse and you got to make, you got to rehearse with the microphone. It's not the same rehearsing it off stage. That's not the same. You got to rehearse it with the microphone and with a designer or an audio person out there who can make adjustments. And, mm-hmm. and ideally with somebody else who's talking to that sound person and saying, no, 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 we need more high end or no, 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 you know, it's too boomy fix it, yeah. you know, I, in a way, like that's almost more important. <laughs> I hate to say it, but it's almost more important because at least then, you know, the audience has a chance of hearing the person. Yeah, you know? I agree. So Thomas, in terms of your creative output and your process and your, your balance of time, because you do so many mm-hmm. things, how, how does that work for you these days? Well, I'm, look, I'm getting older, and so I am trying now to spend more of my time writing um, mm-hmm. than I, I think I did over, you know, my kind of my uh, 30s and 40s. I think in, into my 50s and 60s now, I am um, about to turn 62, and I'm feeling like, um, you know, I'm able to now... I don't know, spend more dedicated time on a daily basis mm-hmm. and, um, and just like, you know, c- kind of come to the office or the studio or however you think of it each day with um, clarity about what it is that I'm trying to do mm-hmm. and, and doing it, um, which feels good. I mean, you know, just that it feels like more of a fluid practice um, of composing and creating. Um, and that, that feels good. Mm-hmm. So are you generally sitting at the piano and sketching things out by hand and like what's how do you physically go about putting it down? Yeah, it's it's different it's different each day. You know, I wrote a piece um a couple of summer well during the pandemic I wrote a piece uh, called Songs from Joe's Chapel. It's a 40 minute cycle in each you know, key, um, kind of in the Chopin, you know, version of like, uh, you start, uh, uh, major then relative minor and you do the circle of fifths, right? Um, each is a miniature. And, um, so they're 24 little movements. When I was writing that, um, I had a really clear idea. Like, you know, I would come in, I knew what my key was that day. I would sit down at the piano and play for about an hour and a half, just play, mm-hmm. A, everything scales in that key ideas in that key maybe I had an idea maybe I didn't but I just played for an hour and a half and at the end of an hour and a half I was like okay what from that am I interests me mm-hmm. what could I work on and I challenged myself to just write a miniature every single day that I was doing it and I you know I and I did it that I did that discipline. Now I'm not always that disciplined, but when I am, I'm happy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, um, it's, it's the kind of thing that I really, so it's a, where there's like free improvisation and then, um, a kind of sitting back and considering oh, like, okay, how can I, um, I've been very inspired by the, the, um, the process, um, of the writer, Jennifer Egan, She's um, uh, an author um, who won the Pulitzer Prize um, a few years back um, for a book um, called, um, now I'm going to miss the title, um, but she, she just finished a book called The Candy House, um, and, uh, which was kind of a sequel um, to that book. And um, she talks about her process in a, in a, in a different way because she's a writer, but she writes by hand. 
mm-hmm. right? Um, she does not use the computer at all to write. She just uses uh, yellow legal pads and, um, and pencils. And she kind of free writes, free associative writing um, for a lot of uh, her process. And that go- can go on for a long, long time before she types things up and begins to think about how she might structure it. And that sense of l- uh, the permission of free improv seems really um, interesting to me as a mm-hmm. composer. Oh, that's great. And are there other creative outlets you, you have need of or, or have fun with beyond music? Um, you know, I, I am the cook in my family. I'm more, you know, just it's just the way it worked out. My wife was a medical student and didn't have much time uh, for preparing meals when, when uh, she was in school. And so I, I just by default sort of became the cook. And so I love cooking. I love the, the uh, you know, the daily challenge of it. I mean, I'm not a fancy cook, but I love the daily challenge of like, oh, I need to figure it out because we need to have a meal. Um, and, um, and so, you know, I'd spend a lot of time, uh, you know, looking at recipes. Um, since I'm from the low country of South Carolina, a lot of the cuisine that I'm interested in playing with and experimenting with, and sometimes just making, um, is, is stuff from South Carolina. Um, cause it's, it's a very particular, it's a rice culture. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a culture that very much influenced by African American cooks. And, um, so I love that. Well, thanks so much for this today. I really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Please do share this with your friends and check out episodes you may have missed at leahroseman.com. If you could buy me a coffee to support the series, that would be wonderful. The link is in the description. Have a wonderful week. <laughs>